so I just really want to say thank you so much for your time. Um, you definitely inspire me and I'm someone who needs inspiring because I'm inspiring other people. You always look to pay it forwards. Um, and um, I'm sure there will be something that you said that someone in the world, their life will never be the same again because of what you said today. Uh, for me, my biggest, my biggest takeaway from what you said is, you know, that voice in your head that, you know, I know better than the voice in my head and I'm not going to be a victim of what I can and probably will always say negative things to myself. And I, and I appreciate you for that. So, Naomi, how can people uh, find out about you? Okay, so um, I'm currently working on getting my own website, but that's the next goal. Um, currently, I'm on LinkedIn, so you can contact me through LinkedIn. I'm quite active on Twitter as well, so you can get hold of me through that. A um, couple of speaking agencies I work through, Room 54 and Inspired Athletes. Um, or get in touch with Thomas International, um, and they can sort of put you through. I would definitely encourage everyone to uh, follow you on uh, LinkedIn, Naomi Riches, and also on Twitter. What's your handle? Naomi Riches MBE. Is that oh, a bit yes. <laughs> we didn't talk about that, did we? You are an MBE. An MBE. Does that mean I'm supposed to call you something? MBE. What? No. Muppet of the British Empire. Uh, no, no, I don't know. Um... Madam. Is it, what does it actually stand <laughs> for, by the no, way? Member. member. Sorry? Member. Member of the British Empire. Well, <laughs> y you are a, a great example. And um, I really appreciate being able to talk to you and find out more about you and share that yeah. with the world. I really do wish you well, and I'm sure our paths will cross again. I know I asked you to speak at our summit in uh, September, but you're away. So another time, uh, another time for sure. Uh, once again, I appreciate your time, and I really do wish you well. It's Pete Cohen here, and you join me for another My365 podcast. And I am delighted uh, with my guest today because... Uh, I'd, I'd never met her before until recently, and I had the pleasure of hearing her speak. And sometimes when you hear people speak speak, and you hear their stories, their stories can really resonate. We talk about the hero's journey. Uh, there was a, a book and a film about Joseph Campbell who talked about everyone in life is on this journey. Everyone is a hero. Everyone faces adversity. You're either in a crisis, coming out of a crisis, or moving into one. Uh, and this is someone who has had some challenges in their life, like many of us, but she also just happens to have an Olympic gold medal. Got a gold medal in the London Olympics uh, in, in the category in, in rowing. Uh, so I'm delighted. My guest, Naomi Riches, how are you today? I am very good. I'm very excited about doing this as well. Thank you. Well, listen, it was a delight uh, to hear you uh, hear you speak. But I suppose the first question I have to ask you is, when you were young, did you ever envisage for a moment that you would end up with an Olympic gold medal? No way. Not in, yeah, no, definitely not. I never really thought I was going to achieve much. I just kind of bumbled along, you know, I just didn't really, didn't really ever think that far ahead. So, yeah, because I think that was one of the things that definitely... Oh, you know, I was at the back and the more you spoke, the more my ears just kind of got bigger and started opening up more because the the story of how you became an Olympic athlete was something which I must I must admit was uh, it's pretty, I suppose it wasn't typical of how most athletes, maybe as children, they know <laughs> that's the path they're going to take and they, they pursue it. So tell us a little bit about how you became uh, an Olympic gold medalist. Well, it was, it was quite interesting, really, because I was never into sport when I was a kid at all. I, like, I, I hated it. And um, because I'm visually impaired, I always struggled at school with, with PE. And so doing sport for a living was like the furthest thing you could possibly imagine. And mm -hmm. um, when it came to the Olympics, we always as a family would sit down and watch the rowing. So for some reason that had always sort of resonated with me. And it was always something that I looked at. And I was like, wow, that is just so cool. Um, so I went to Marlow Rowing Club um, when I started university and I said I'd like to learn to row please and they went we don't do any learning courses at the moment sorry so nothing so I just carried on at the student union bar as you do doing bicep curls with a pint glass that was it yeah but then second <laughs> second year of uni I got a phone call from a guy called Simon and he said your friend Paul who's in the disabled rowing team has given me your number and you're tall and you're a girl and you can't see and we need you in the Paralympic rowing team and I went uh all right yeah I could give that a go fell in love with it straight away 
and that was it. It went from there, really. It grew over the next nine years into a well-respected, well-funded Paralympic program. Well, I suppose one of the amazing things about that is, you know, is it just by chance the fact that you'd always wanted to do it and the guy that called you up and asked you if you wanted to do it, he didn't know, did he? He didn't know that, A, you liked rowing and B, you'd actually tried to do it and been turned down. So it's quite weird. I suppose maybe there's something in being careful what you wish for in life. Um, so when you, yeah. did you, did you take to it like, I'm sorry to use that pun, but did you take duck a duck? Water. Did you take it? Yes. <laughs> did you take to yeah. it like a duck to water? I did. I did. It was just very very natural it was a, it was a team sport it, it I love working in a team I love being around other people bouncing ideas off them training together and just well when we when we started we were told look the reason we're really interested is because in four months time there's a world championships in in Spain and GB want to send an, an adaptive crew which is before it became Paralympic sport it was an adaptive it was adaptive rowing so they said we want to send a boat out in in july to spain but we don't have any girls and it has to be a mixed crew mm -hmm. so i got in the boat and four months later i had a goal i had something it wasn't just getting in the boat and playing about i had a reason to be there yeah and so it just literally was the steepest learning curve you could possibly ever imagine but went to the world championships four months later and came back with a gold medal so kind of kind of cool well, and I know that it wasn't straight straight sailing, straight rowing, I should say, from going from becoming a world champion to becoming the Olympic uh, medalist. But let, let, let's kind of sidetrack a little bit, because I suppose what I'm really curious about now is in your life, what is it that you're you've retired now, right? You've retired from rowing. What is it that you are passionate yeah. about? Because I know hearing you talk, you had a, a pretty challenging childhood in terms of lack of self-confidence like 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 many people but never really thinking that you were maybe going to make anything of yourself whatever that means but you clearly have done something incredible what is your life about today now it's about sharing my story in a kind of in a way like such as this or it's about having the tools at my disposal to help people discover more about themselves to help people become more self-aware, to help people become better working in that team environment. And I'm fortunate enough to be doing exactly that with the company I work for now, all because I chatted to a guy in a pub. <laughs> and wow. I'd use psychometric profiling in my one of my trickiest times in sport. And it taught me so much about myself. And when I chatted to this guy, Simon, in my local pub after I retired, and he said, that's exactly what we do down the road at Thomas International, come and talk to the MD. So I went and had a chat with the MD of, of Thomas Sport and before I knew it, I was an associate and I was able to do for other people what I'd had the opportunity to do and and, and learn from a few years before. You know, so it, 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 it's, uh, it's, it's amazing and I hope people that are listening to this realise that, uh, you know, so much can be achieved once you decide to change. What I love about your story and, and what I love about athletes is often the training so hard for something that training can you can get so much from it you know above and beyond what you're actually training for and I think so many yeah. people in their life they're not really training for much they're just doing what they do without really thinking about doing something that perhaps they really really are passionate about but I suppose the thing I would love to discuss with you is what are some of the truths what are some of the things that you found out that just weren't true about yourself because I think many people when they grow up they they learn to convince themselves that they are a certain type of a person. What is it that you fundamentally broke? What is it that are some of the biggest changes that you made in your own kind of ways of thinking? I think the the biggest thing for me, and I still struggle with it, I still have demons in my head that tell me the opposite. But for me to actually realize that despite my eyesight, if I want to do something and I want to do it enough, that I am going to find a way end of you know I am gonna find a way to achieve it if I want it enough if I ask the right people if I experiment if I try things out I'm gonna to get to do it and because when I was younger that was the thing that was always I was always told is you can't because of your eyes you can't because of your eyes not by my parents my parents were just incredible they gave me every opportunity to help me grow develop mm -hmm. learn you know do exciting things but school shocking it was 
barrier after barrier after barrier. So I think probably the biggest thing for me is just you can never mind what people tell you. If you want it enough, you will find a way. Yeah, you know, obviously, I think a lot of people would find it maybe even easier if they had the impairment that, that you have or had or however you want to. I don't know how, how you how you say it. But you are so much more than that. You see, I think what's so fascinating about people is they always make up something or they always come up with some some reason as to why they don't do what it is that they, they want to do. But I, I saw um, a clip from the Usain Bolt film and he actually said, you know, at the beginning of every season, he'd say, have I still got it? You know, have I still got the ability to run fast? And of course, all of us are going, oh, come on, you're the fastest man in the world. It's got to be, you've got to have that. But no, he's like all of us. We all have a negative voice in our head. But it sounds like one of the biggest changes that you made was learning how to become more aware of that neg negative voice, to overcome it, yeah. to override it. Is yeah. that something that you did? Yeah, it is. And it's, you know, I still call it and I still have the conversations now with my with my now boss at Thomas International. And I say I was talking to actually my one to one and I was saying sometimes I think to myself, one day someone's going to find me out and they're going to think I'm, that I'm they'll realize I'm a fraud. It can't all be real. Like it's like this internal terrorist in my mind mm -hmm. that's telling me that I'm not as good as everyone thinks I am or that I think I am. Someone's going to find me out someday, but yeah. it's not going to happen. But there's that little bit of doubt in there that one day someone will pull the curtain aside and it will all have been a big dream or something, you know? Yeah. Kind of, you, you think, kind of weird. Do you think that internal terrorist, because we call it a duck, as you know, because obviously you heard me, yeah. me speak as well, that that internal terrorist, do you think that somewhere down the line it's maybe got a good intention, that it just maybe doesn't want you to fail, it doesn't want you to uh, do something that maybe yeah. you're not capable of doing? Yeah, I think it, that's that's the voice that whilst a lot of the time seems like quite a negative input to a lot of people and to me I know that for sure but actually in order for, because it does that it makes me want it more and try even harder yeah it's kind of somebody said to me so you're living in the past if you keep remembering all the times people were horrible to you and told you you couldn't yeah. and I said no I'm not I'm using it it is the fire in my belly that every day makes me do more makes me work harder and makes me be better that is what gives me the motivation to go and do what I do. Wow. And, and is that a message that you pass on to other people? Yeah, definitely. So when yeah. you're... When, sorry, go on. Carry on. Sorry. I was going to say, no matter how silly you think it is, the, the reason that you're being stopped or you think you're being stopped from doing it, it's, yeah. it's you know, you just prove them wrong. Go out there and prove the buggers wrong, you know? Hmm. And how important is it, do you think, to prove the voice in your head wrong as well? it's quite important um yeah. but it will come back with a different argument and still quite try, try and yeah. try and derail you but um but yeah i think it is, it is important at least to be able to rather than just listening to that voice in your head be able to have a conversation with it and tell it to shut up <laughs> yeah um, no, i no, i couldn't agree with you more i, I think from from my experience because i know everyone's different i think if we're making generalizations i think the duck does want you to be better it does but it's just scared because it's that hard work you know and and I think a lot of people who don't know much about rowing, I mean, I think you know I, I was friendly with um, uh, James Cracknell, and I actually even trained with him a few times. So James Cracknell has won a, Cracknell has won a few uh, gold medals. Rowing is ridiculous in terms of the training. The me First of all, the, they talk about the mentality of rowers. Yes, definitely. There's something a little bit crazy about them. But the training yeah. that they do, like pulling these rowing machines apart and the, and the weights and so on and so forth, which I'd love... Um, also to discuss with you but let me just ask you another question when you when you're getting up in front of people and you're talking and you're telling your story what is it that you want them to feel I want them to kind of to go away and not think well she did it she's amazing I want them to go away and think if she can then I can yeah yeah I, I love to, that to my, I love kind that. of give them that little bit of hope I guess. You know, I, I love that. And I sometimes think... not always for them as in sometimes for, so for example, I do a lot of um, sports awards evenings at schools and I, I talk to both parents and, and the students and more than the students coming up to me, I've had parents come up to me and say, thank you so much because I can now use this when my lad or my little girl has her little wobbles of confidence and she's rubbish. I can remind her of what you said. 
Yeah. That is like absolute gold dust for me. Yeah, I think uh, stories can really change people's lives and people hear it. And, and what I love about you is the fact that you, you just want to give so much back. You want to take what you do. You want other people to become, a, as corny as it sounds, gold medalists in their own life, yeah. in, in whatever they looking to do to, to be the best. It is probably one of the greatest achievements, isn't it, in life to to decide to do something and then yeah. achieve it. But you and I both know, because we all do it, I'm yeah. sure, from time to time, we decide to do something and then yeah. we just let ourselves yeah. down. We don't live up to our expectations that we've set ourselves. Mm. So but I suppose that the other thing I wanted to ask you, how important is it, for you, what, what sort of support did you get from the people around you? As in outside of the sport itself? Everything, you know, everything in your pursuit of working towards where it is that you want to go, what role did support play? It was a sounding board for those dark days. It was an expertise that I didn't have, that I knew somebody else could could teach me or could, you know, could share with me. It was having having that support, knowing that I someone had my back. Even if they weren't, you know, it's not like they couldn't they couldn't row it for me or they couldn't do the project for me with the students or they could they couldn't do it for me, but they were there. They were just that little backbone that kept me on task and kept me and also for me having the support it was a group of people I couldn't let down as well. So for me, I'm quite a team player. It wasn't just me. If I didn't achieve it, it wasn't just me I was letting down. It was my dad. It was my mum. You know, it was my friends. It was all the people that had said, we understand why you can't come to our wedding. You've got something far more important to do in training. Yeah. And then if I didn't achieve, I'd feel, I don't know, I'd kind of it'd eat away at me. So it was not only the, the expertise and the knowledge that they might have had that I didn't but it was that knowledge that I was sort of doing it for them as well because they'd all invested time into me and I had to do something in return. So, so that's, again, so powerful. I've been talking about it this week in uh, some broadcasts we've been doing about how in life, you know, the whole perseverance. Well, what are you persevering? If you're persevering something that is just for you, chances are you're only going to get so far. But if you're persevering on something because it's not just about you, it's about doing it for everyone else. So how much of what you were doing in, in the working towards competing in London at the Olympics, how much of that was you doing, you weren't just doing it for you, you weren't just doing it for your three teammates. Um, you, had, you have a Cox as well, I can't remember in the, yeah, yeah so there's, for, for, for those, and, 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 your, <laughs> and, and your coaches and everybody else, how much yeah. of you were doing it for them as well? Yeah, a lot, because they've invested their time in it. And it matters what happens when we come across the finish line doesn't just matter to me. Yeah. And also it mattered to the to the country. We had the the expectations of G B on our shoulders. Yeah. To achieve that medal. So that's huge. Yeah, yeah. And it can it can drown if you let it get too heavy, but it's it's huge as well and it can also give you that real uh, that you need when it's really getting getting tough. Wow. So let let's let me put my mug down. Let's let's talk about London because obviously the London Olympics for those of you that are us are in Great Britain probably means more to people than well, that don't come from this country because it was remarkable that the whole thing and you just said oh. something. T tell us. I mean, I don't know where to start, but tell us about the the, the whole experience. <laughs> what did it mean to you to compete for your country in in the Olympics in the Olympic Games? Oh. It's it's just phenomenal because that that was the reason I was getting out of bed in the morning. That was the reason when it was tough, when I did lose my seat and had to fight to get it back in 2010 and all that all that rubbish stuff, all the bad days, it was all so that I could walk out in that kit and get in that boat on that final day in 2012. That was it was all for those three minutes, 19 seconds. That was it. That was what I wanted it for. So actually to be there, to be given the kit, to, to go into the village, to see where you're staying, to the first time we went down to Dorney Lake, oh my God, it's the most two-dimensional, boring landscape, Dorney. And they transformed it into this three-dimensional, four-dimensional rowing stadium that was just incredible. And I had no idea what it was going to look. I'd seen it on like rough like graphics and things. I was just, I just couldn't, I had to pick my jaw up off the floor, you know, it was absolutely phenomenal. And people were there on the race days really early yeah. to get good. So when we went out, we'd go out and do a pre-paddle of about four kilometers, six kilometers. 
about three hours before we had to race, before they closed the lake for racing. And there'd be people there at that time in the morning yelling for you before you were even, you know, you were just warming up. And they'd be there hours ahead of when they needed to be, just so they could see you and shout for you. And you knew that a lot of them would be probably crazy, your friends and family. You know, the, the, the mental people that had fought tooth and nail to get tickets to come and see their mate, you know, compete at a game. And it was, yeah, it was just remarkable. Well, and I, then, I, sorry, carry on, please, please carry on. I was yeah. saying then when we actually raced, I couldn't, for the last 300 metres, I could not hear our Cox Lily. She had speakers in the boat and she had a microphone. Couldn't hear a word she was saying and I couldn't hear the Germans who were next to us who were our biggest competition because the number of people at Dorney Lake and the noise was, it was everywhere. It was in your bones. It was it, like the water was almost vibrating with the sound. It was incredible, but I couldn't hear anything else. All I could hear was thousands of people shouting for GB, which is pretty good, pretty cool. You know, a great motivator. But it was, would have been quite useful to actually hear what was going on, <laughs> going on in the race. But oh, I, I bet that, it was... In that, that audience got me across the line. I bet it was interesting when you actually watched it back yourself and can hear and see everything kind of going on but yeah. i suppose the, the one of the questions i wanted to ask you was when when you're going through something like this um i'm, I'm sure there's only a certain amount of preparation that you can that you can that you can actually do now i hopefully everyone will maybe get a chance to hear you speak in person one day because you are a phenomenal speaker and there's a lot more to your story i, I know i know from your well, you got an amazing feedback. You got better feedback than I did, and that's saying something. Oh. So, no, I, it was it was unbelievably awesome. It really was. And uh, it was what what was fascinating, and people maybe when they hear your story in, it, in its in its flarity, that's not a word, in, in its full story of realizing what you went through, because it wasn't plain sailing from going from the world championships to to competing and, and getting your spot in the boat, and that's and a few other things that you faced along the way. But just talk it talk me through in terms of. Uh, what did it feel like when you actually got, you know, you put the gold medal, that, put the gold medal was put on you? Do you what, what, what were your overriding memory of that? I, I really, it was so surreal. I, it's really hard to remember. Yeah. It's kind of partly relief because I knew it had been close with the Germans, so it was only a couple of seconds in it. But just so much joy and happiness it was like spilling out of every pore yeah. i could not stop smiling and i'm thinking about it now and like my face is starting to hurt because i'm smiling so much <laughs> but you know react in different ways pam was in tears dave wasn't sure whether he was going to cry or smile lily was laughing i was smiling and laughing and you just you never know how you're going to react in a situation like that but it was yeah i was kind of thinking is this actually real <laughs> is mm. this really happening to me seriously you know so it was um yeah it was it was very very surreal it's like one of those dreams you wake up in the morning you feel awesome and then gradually throughout the day you forget little details so yeah. i'm kind of gradually like, trying to clutch hold of it and keep that memory alive but it seems to be slipping away it's really strange well you've obviously you're moved, you've moved into a new phase of your life so i suppose this is the question which um, everyone asks you you know how has your life changed since this has happened um it's changed in terms of my, in terms of the community I live in, in Marlow. We're very much, it's a very close-knit town in terms of support, in yeah. terms of everyone knows everybody. It's not so small that everyone knows everyone's business, but it's small enough for you to know a lot of people. You go, you just try and go shopping and you'll bump into people all the time. Yeah. You know, and just being part of that community and having a gold post box yes. in Marlow High School, yes. me... I've seen it's that. Just, I've seen that. It's wonderful. It's yeah. a big fat one. It's yeah. great. <laughs> I've got two post boxes between my house and that one, and I have to walk all the way to that one to post. Isn't that amazing? Them. For those of you that don't know, who maybe don't live in the UK, um, it was one of the things that uh, that happened for a lot of the gold medalists that they have now post boxes that have been patent, 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 patent. What is wrong with me? Painted, gold, and you've not got one. You've got two, right? Which is well, it's a double one, but it's it's in the same place, but it is a double oh, one. That's fantastic. That one. That's fantastic. So I suppose I know a lot of athletes because a lot of the athletes I worked with who did become very successful in terms of winning after they competed, a lot of them really struggled. Jonathan Edwards is a classic example, triple jumper, who, you know, you, you train all your life uh, to do something and then you decide to stop. 
Um, did you have anything like yeah. that? Did you have some sort of, you know, coming back down to earth? It kind of was, it was difficult. I did leave rowing because I wanted to leave rowing. Yeah. It wasn't because of not being selected. It wasn't because of injury. It wasn't forced. It was a choice that I made. So that probably made it easier. Yeah. A lot of athletes if they have to retire and they don't want to. That's probably, that's going to make it harder immediately. But you do always get this kind of, this kind of come down because you've gone from being the best in the world at something yeah. to being an ordinary person who needs to get a job. Yeah. And I'm not putting anybody who needs to get a job down. No, of course not. But yeah. Yeah. You've come out of a job as the MD or you've come out of a, a the job that you, you loved, the best in the world, and you're suddenly you've got no direction. When life is mapped out to the point where you knew those three weeks in September were for your holiday, you knew the World Championships was in August, you knew where the World Cups were, you knew when the tests were, you knew your life was literally mapped out for you 365 days in advance, mm. or sometimes four years in advance, and that's suddenly... So I kind of... I basically threw myself into everything and said yes to every opportunity, hoping something would work out. It all bloody worked out, so I had to start cutting things off and saying, oh, "Sorry, I can't, haven't got time to do that anymore." So, mm. but, but but I think that's the the uh, the way you have to do it is just throw yourself into everything. But the thing that I found really interesting, and you sort of mentioned it earlier on, is what you gain other than just the ability to go backwards quickly on water in a boat. Yeah, you gain so much more from a sport, and I didn't really recognise any of that until I was thinking about retiring. And then I sat down with the performance lifestyle advisor at Bisham Abbey and she said, okay, we're going to talk about the skills that you've picked up. Uh, well, I know how to do a power clean. I know how to row a boat. What do you mean? And she said, teamwork, goal setting, time management, organization, communication. And she listed all these things. She's like, you've got these because of what you've done yeah. in your training. And it kind of made me realize how many life skills and skills that employers want I picked up without realizing yeah. it. Yeah, it's 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 awesome, and I, I have I definitely have two more questions for you. So I suppose the yeah. first the first one is why do you think it's important for people in their day to day life to have things to work towards goals which maybe stretch them in some way? Do you think that's something that people should do? I think it is something people should do, um, but you should make it relative to you because some people. I lost you there. I'm not sure if you're still there. Hello. Yeah, sorry, I lost you there just for a second. You were saying you got you got to the point of saying um, that people should set goals, but they should be relative to them. Yeah. So if you've got, for example, if you if you think climbing Everest is a really good idea and you want to make it a challenge, yeah, yep. Yeah. I just lost you there a second again as well. And whether you can still hear me, um, but I suppose my last question was going to be um, in terms of your goals. Now, what what goals do you have in your life right now that you're working towards? Not sure. Yeah. Um, can you hear me again? Yeah, I can hear you. So I was just saying that. Um, what, what what goals do you have right now? So you're saying that for people, everyday people, look, it is important to have goals. Yeah. Why? Do you think it's because of that sense of a feeling and accomplishment that people yeah. get from? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It, you, if you've achieved something for you, then you know, and for the people around you, I've got a friend who's just she just went and decided to do um a, a open university degree in um creative writing yeah and she's really proud of herself she's done that and while she's done that she's got married bought a house and had a kid and developed her career but she's just one of those people that just does stuff you know she's yeah. constantly doing things other people it might just be my goal is to make sure that my my kids grow up happy and not wanting yeah that is just as admirable as a goal as a gold medalist a gold medal at the paralympics is yeah. you know it's relative to you so for me for me now it's about really 
growing my career, working on my speaking career, branding myself a bit better so that I can actually go out and make have more of an impact. And also focusing on my career within Thomas. I'm um, a client development consultant, so I go and deliver and do the delivery of all the programs and things that we do. And yeah. I love that because it's actually talking to people. It's not selling. It's not sitting behind a desk every day. So I really want to become like... It's just my need to want to be really, really good at it. I really want to become one of the best, best ones in the team. But that's just the way. But we all do that in our in our team. We all want to be the expert. Yeah. So we're all sort of striving. Yeah, it's 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 amazing. And your story has really touched me. And I know that there will be people that will be listening to this from all over the world who will be touched by your story. In fact, our goal in doing these podcasts is that someone out there somewhere will listen to this they will take something away from what you said and it will have an impact on their lives and who knows it might even have an impact on someone else's life by that person deciding to do something uh, differently